I've been driving Mustangs since the 60s, and I always believed you gotta have a V8 engine if you want to have fun driving them. But times have changed, and so have I. Sure, this new Mustang only has a 2.3 liter four-cylinder engine. But what a four-cylinder engine. It puts out 310 horsepower and 320 foot-pounds of torque. Now you might very well ask, how does such a small engine put out 310 horsepower? Well, here's how. First, it uses gasoline direct injection. With gasoline direct injection, it's more like a diesel. There's a regular fuel pump that pumps fuel from the gas tank up top here. Then this mechanical pump boosts it up to 3,000 PSI. Then that high pressure fuel is pumped the whole way to the fuel injectors on the rail, which are direct injectors. They inject fuel right into the cylinders. And that's a more efficient way of distributing the fuel so you get more power and better gas mileage at the same time. Heck, I got 32 miles a gallon when I drove it going 55 miles an hour. Not that I drove 55 miles an hour for all that long, because realize, the faster you drive, the worse your gas mileage you get. And I'm a pretty fast driver, so <laughs> my wife would get 32 miles a gallon, but I won't. Now the other way it makes so much power is with this twin scroll turbocharger. It's a modern design turbocharger that works almost like two turbochargers, but it doesn't have turbo leg like two turbochargers often will have. And if you look at the front of the engine, you'll see there's a fan belt. It runs the water pump. It runs the alternator, and it runs the air conditioner, but there's no power steering pump. And that's because it has electric power steering. That further gets you better gas mileage and more power. And you can use that power in many ways. As you can see now, it idles quite smooth. You can set it up for just normal driving. Or you can flip one switch, turn the traction control off and drive a little bit harder. And you can flip another switch, and you make steering feel normal, sport, or comfort. Since it has electric power steering, the computer can adjust it lots of ways. But my favorite is the last button, the mode button. You hit that, you can drive normal, you can drive sport, you can drive track, or you can drive snow or wet. Of course, you know what I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna run it on track, even though you're supposed to only do that on the track. That's why it's got a little helmet sitting on the bottom warning you. It turns a lot of the speed controls off unless you get into a really extreme situation, then it will put traction control and stuff back on. Because realize, modern day racing cars even have traction control. It's on the far end of traction control, but it's still there to keep them from killing each other. But I do have to say, one thing surprised me about this Mustang. My wife actually liked it. And that's because she didn't like the way they rode. She said they were too bumpy. Since Ford redesigned the rear suspension to join the 21st century, and they now have fully independent suspension in the back, they really do ride a lot better. She didn't know anything about this at all. She just knew that it rode a lot better and she liked driving it. So if you're thinking about getting a new pony car, you might think four cylinder this time. Today I'm gonna to talk about why not to buy a Ford EcoBoost engine. For those of you who don't know, an EcoBoost engine system is an engine that has turbocharging, gasoline direct fuel injection, and variable valve timing. It can increase fuel economy and decrease carbon dioxide emissions. But of course, here's the warning. You get a turbocharged car with gasoline direct injection that has more power. The average Joe, like me, is going to be driving it like a maniac, stepping on the gas, revving the engine up. And then, of course, it gets worse gas mileage. Now, first, let's break it down. Turbocharging, that's been around for a long time. It just uses your exhaust gas to spin a turbine. And then the other end of the turbine, that compresses air and shoots more air into the engine, giving it more power. And yes, you can get better gas mileage if you drive like the granny going to church on Sunday. <laughs> but like I say, if you drive it hard, that's going to negate any positive effects. Most people I know that have turbocharged cars, they get worse gas mileage because they drive them harder. Now, turbocharging is used instead of supercharging in most cars because turbocharging is more efficient. It's using the gas that's in your exhaust that's already there, where a supercharger has a pulley that either runs with an electric motor or runs off of your crank with a fan belt, and that actually decreases gas mileage because you're using up energy in order to operate the supercharger. That's why they're all turbochargers now, because the gasoline ratings by the government is higher. Now, the second aspect of these EcoBoost engine is variable valve timing, and that's been around a while too. I've even made videos on that. The modern cars can control how the valves open and close. So when you're just idling or cruising, 
it can have a lower profile to get better gas mileage, but when you want to accelerate, it can open the valves up wider, give them a longer duration, so you can have better acceleration and power. Now Honda was really the first company to mass produce efficient VVT variable valve timing engines, and they've been around long enough that they're a pretty reliable system with the exception of a lot of the Ford Motorcraft ones, it wear out prematurely. Gear is run by a chain and operates the cams. That assembly would start coming apart and wobbling. It's a design flaw. I mean, they worked fine until they broke, but they broke too early. I had to replace some of them when they had 70, 80,000 miles on them. And the third part of the EcoBoost engine is the GDI, the gasoline direct injection. Instead of having fuel injectors like this Toyota, that spray in the intake manifold and the fuel is then sucked in through the valves of the engine. The fuel injectors spray fuel directly into the cylinders. They're much higher pressures. This old Toyota is maybe 45 PSI. The GDI ones are well over a thousand PSI inside. It's an interesting design, but when you start bumping up the pressures like that, kind of asking for problems as they age. So when you combine super high fuel pressure with super high air pressure being pumped in by a turbo variable valve timing where the cams can move around so the valves open and close less there are a lot of things that can go wrong in these engines carbon buildup on the intake valves now in 2018 Ford redesigned it especially in their V6 engines they're putting in the F-150s so they had both a port fuel injection like my Toyota there that has lower pressure and a GDI system that worked by computers so that every once in a while the port ones are used so they clean the valves up and carbon doesn't build up because gasoline is a very good solvent. It has two separate fuel injection systems. Another level of complexity run by computers and I'm predicting hey probably have problems with them in the future they just started doing it last year knowing how these things work out there's almost always teething problems with those things. GM had their version of it and they put it in their four cylinder engines, they're literally four cylinder engines and those high pressure fuel pumps they have to put over a thousand PSI out to those GDI injectors. Tons of them went bad and either would leak or wouldn't work anymore and it didn't happen until they were a few years old so me I'd wait. Take the 2012 F-150 that had the V6 between the turbocharger and the engine is what's called the intercooler because you don't want the air to be too hot, it cools it off. And they were getting condensation inside the intercooler which would build up water, then the water would be stuck into the engine and it caused problems. A lot of stumbling, hesitation, and that was 2012. It takes a few years to figure these things out. And if you have one of these 3.5 liter V6 EcoBoost engines, realize there have been at least nine software updates. They have to do with the vacuum, they have to do with the ignition timing, and they even have to do with the transmission shifting. So as you can see, this is kind of a work in progress, but if you happen to know one of these 3.5 V6 EcoBoost engine systems, hey, if you're having a problem, first thing you do, have all the software calibrations check. It's easy for them to do with the dealer. If it needs upgraded software, they can just update the software. And if you haven't had any software updated and you've owned it for a long time, odds are it's going to need some updating. I get an F-150 with a V8 engine in it. I would want one that's proven, it's going to hold up, be able to pull stuff, and not have any problems. They're worried about gas mileage and power. They can always put smaller engines in, they don't have enough power. So they add all this stuff on top of a small engine. It's a recipe for disaster in the long run. Now Ford does put EcoBoost in lots of their engines. They have a two liter four cylinder one. They had to redesign them. And the new design doesn't share that much with the old design. They kind of found out that the old design, eh, it wasn't panning out so well. When they redesigned it, it's still a two liter engine, but they put a twin scroll turbocharger compressor on it, changed a bunch of stuff. It's lighter. They use a lot more aluminum. They wait till something's been tried test it out and proven that it's reliable especially when it has anything to do with aluminum parts in cars look at the Honda CRVs they went to all this aluminum stuff now they've got an oil dilution problem that fuel is getting into the oil because of either the software or the engine design Honda's never had that problem before you start ramping this technology up you're just asking for failures here and there because there's so much technology so much higher pressure much larger use of aluminum, which as anybody knows, aluminum is pretty soft. This stuff's going to wear a lot faster than cast iron. Shelby Cobras that they were making 
one point in time, they tried using an aluminum block on that big V8. Well, they had engines overheating, blowing, and aluminum just wouldn't hold up. They went back to making them with cast iron blocks. And they stopped having the overheating and cracking problems that the aluminum ones had. I can make a lot of money fixing those things when they break down too, you know? But I'm not that kind of guy. That's the advantage of low overhead like me. I work by myself, for myself. I don't have to pay a million dollars in overhead like at a big dealership just to break even. And sure, there's all kinds of pressure on the manufacturers to have better gas mileage and to pollute less. And Americans, of course, they still want fast vehicles. You don't want to drive around some tiny little thing that doesn't go fast, but you're using smaller and smaller engines. Using this technology is about the only way that you can do it. But believe me, all this added technology and complexity, it's going to cost you in the long run if you keep your cars longer than the warranty period. Because car repair, hey, it's gone a long way from my grandfather's day who was also a mechanic. He fixed cars with hammers, screwdrivers, listen with his ears. You can't do that with modern cars. Even I can be stumped when a car comes in and it doesn't shift right. It might have nothing to do with the transmission. It could be that there's a problem in the fuel injection system and that feeds back to the computer so the transmission acts up. And it's actually an engine problem, not a transmission problem, even though you feel it in the shifting. Because you kind of get a hint that they're guessing when they have nine software updates to these systems. I would advise you not to buy an EcoBoost system as they presently stand. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.